A is for Auntie, the oldest of all. She rocks all us children to sleep in her shawl. D is for Daniel, who tends to the door. He took care of Massa way back for the war. F is for Felix, who won't do no work. He's lazy and shiftless and ready to shirk. Z is for Zonia, chunky and small. But here come the missus, so I guess just them all. Listen, Mammy, I ain't no way to wash clothes. What you all need is rhythm. What, 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 what do you all mean, rhythm? Really? <laughs> I'll show you what I mean. The Mammy, the Piccaninny, the Coon, the Sambo, the Uncle. Well into the middle of the 20th century, these were some of the most popular depictions of black Americans. Rubbly up there! She rubbed and rubbed the knuckle draw them down to the nub, yeah! By 1941, when this cartoon was made, Images like these permeated American culture. These were the images that decorated our homes, that served and amused and made us laugh. Taken for granted, they worked their way into the mainstream of American life. Of ethnic caricatures in America, these have been the most enduring. Today, there's little doubt that these images shape the most gut-level feelings about race. When you see hundreds of them in all parts of the country persisting over a very long period of time, they have to have meaning. They obviously uh, appeal to people. They appeal to the creator, but they appeal also to the consumers, those who read the cart look at the cartoons or read the novels or buy the artifacts. It's not just that it's in the figurines and in the, you know, the coffee pots and so on. It is that we are seen that way, perceived that way, even in terms of public policy. And that our lives are lived under that shadow. And sometimes we then even become to believe it ourselves. Blacks don't really look like that. So why uh, is it so appealing to people to think they look like that and to pretend they look like that and to like to look at icons that look like that? You look at them often enough, and black people begin to look like that, even though they don't. Um, so that they've had a great impact in our society. They therefore tell us both about the inner desires of the people who create and consume them, and also they tell us about some of the forces that shape reality for a large portions of our population. Well now, children, tonight old Uncle Tom is going to tell you the real true story about Uncle Tom's cabin. Now, uh, this is the... Contained in these cultural images is the history of our national conscience, a conscience striving to reconcile the paradox of racism in a nation founded on human equality, a conscience coping with this profound contradiction through caricature. What were the consequences of these caricatures? How did they mold and mirror the reality of racial tensions in America for more than 100 years? I got a hat on my head, shoes on my feet, so hot need I care, for I'm the luckiest coon in this town. In the early 1900s, images and songs portrayed a simple, docile, laughing black man, the Sambo.
This image became one of the classic portrayals of black men in film. Carefree and irresponsible, the Sambo was quick to avoid work while reveling in the easy pleasures of food, dance, and song. His life was one of childlike contentment. Well, can I help because I got an ear for music? Yeah, now all this got is a ear for music and a mouth for both of them. You better get a desire for work. The happy Sambo began his stage life in the late 1820s when a man named T.D. Rice brought a new sensation to American theater. Rice was known as an Ethiopian delineator, a white comedian who performed in blackface. The name of his routine would later become the symbol of segregation in the South. The Jim Crow was a dance that started on the plantations as a result of dancing being outlawed in 1690. Dancing was said to be crossing your feet by the church. And so the slaves created a way of shuffling and sliding to safely glide around the laws without crossing their feet. The slaves had a saying for their cunning in skirting the law. Wheel about and turn about and jump just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. According to legend, T.D. Rice saw a crippled black man dancing an exaggerated Jim Crow dance. Rice took the man's tattered clothes and that night imitated him on stage. It was an instant success. And America loved it. And a bevy of imitators came about. Uh, literally hundreds of men tore up their clothes, discarded their their perfect dialects of the black man and began to do this exaggerated character dance which became known as the Jim Crow character. And so here we have Jim Crow, T.D. Rice, taking a dance which was altered by a law from a man who was crippled and exaggerating it again, and he had no intention of presenting truth. But what was bought by the majority of people in Ohio and in the Louisiana Territory and in, along the Erie Canal was that this was a true image, and it was a devastating image. People in small towns who had never seen blacks, you know, and suddenly saw rice, bought that as a black image. In 1843, a group of blackface performers joined together to form a single troupe. Instead of delineators, they call themselves minstrels. The minstrel show captivated broad audiences, mostly in the North, and emerged as America's first form of national popular entertainment. Like movies today, Successful minstrels played to the tastes and values of their audiences. Jim Crow, reflecting popular demand, evolved into the singing, dancing Sambo. This light-hearted figure became one of the most potent forces in the politics of slavery. The minstrelry era really took off at the same time that the abolitionist movement took off. As there were people working to end slavery, people working to eradicate slavery, there were also people increasing the exaggerated portrayals that we find in the, in the minstrel material. Minstrel caricatures mirrored the prevailing belief that slavery was good for the slave, since it drew upon his natural inferiority and willingness to serve. Slaves were content. The proof was offered in the image of the happy Sambo. The old plantation was presented as a, a kind of paradise. Well, white Americans were being constantly bombarded with the image of happy slaves, is what it amounted to. So slavery must be a good institution if, if the slaves were happy and the masters were kindly. And so that whole cultural image of a 
benign or beneficent institution was was projected uh, constantly in the in the period immediately before the Civil War. So blessed with moderate work, with ample fare, with all the good the starving pauper needs, the happier slave on each plantation leaves. I am leads. quite sure they never could become a happier people than I find them here. No tribe of people have ever passed from barbarism to civilization whose progress has been more secure from harm, more genial to their character, or better adapted to their intellectual feebleness than the Negroes. Down the play. We'll make it ring both night and day. If we care not what the white folks say, they, they can't get, get us to run away. <laughs> <laughs> Time and again, these sentiments were expressed in the popular songs and novels before the Civil War. For many Americans, North and South, the myth of Sambo resolved both the moral and political conflict of allowing slavery in a free society. On the one hand, whites like to think of their blacks as Sambos in the, in the antebellum period, but they could never have operated plantations with Sambos, and they knew that. The slavery debate grew more heated as the Civil War approached. Minstrels playing to conservative sentiment turned their attention to free blacks in the north, and a new character appeared beside the southern Sambo, Zip Coon. Transcendentalism is that, that, that spiritual cognizance of uh, uh, the psychological uh, 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 irrefragibility. Uh, a dandy and a buffoon, Zip Coon's attempts to imitate whites mocked the notion of racial equality. Together, Zip Coon and Sambo provided a double-edged defense of slavery. Zip Coon, proof of blacks' ludicrous failure to adapt to freedom, and Sambo, the fantasy of happy darkies in their proper place. I got to take down the judge's clothes, got to take them in the house, yes, Lord. Got to get out that old ironing board, pick some up for the jazz to wear. Mm -hmm. When this film was released in 1934, the black mammy had become such a stable figure in portraits of the old South, it was hard to imagine a Southern home without her. Praise the Lord, Mr. Holmes! Is your hand in you? Hi, Aunt Delcy. How come you here? Like the happy Sambo, the mammy emerged as a defense of slavery. Plantation novels and minstrel shows presented her as fat, pitch black, and happily obedient to her master and mistress. You stay here. Us is going to kill the high stepness rooster in the yard and a great big bowl of milk gravy and grits. And waffles. Don't you worry now, honey. You's home now. Miss Rose, home. Miss Rose, home. She was always presented as docile, loyal, uh, protective of the White House and the big house, an indication that, um, that she understood um, the value of the society. She is presented almost as an antithesis of the white lady, and the person who does not have the qualities of fragility and beauty which would make her valued in the society. With her hair hidden beneath a bandana, her ample weight, dark skin, and coarse manners, the mammy was stripped of sexual allure. Faithfully, she served the master's household in popular fiction and theater, but here her presence never evoked sexual tension. If the mammy were to be a sexual being, which of course in reality she was, but if she was, were to be that in myth and in fiction and so on, she would become a threat to the mistress of the house, she would become a threat to the entire system. Uh, she, because she would then be capable of being desired by the master of the house. We know from reading the diaries and the letters of slave mistresses that this is very often the case and created much disruption, much friction in this supposedly happy plantation system that the planters wanted to project. Around 
While happy in her subservience to whites, the mammy was portrayed quite differently in relations with her own family. In your usual setup in American society, the person who controls is the male. The mammy is presented as the controller, a way of indicating, quote unquote, how inferior we are. That men are weak and women are strong, the very opposite of the way it's supposed to be according to the societal norms. So the mammy strikes at two important concepts uh, of gender in, in um, antebellum society. She is strong, asexual, and ugly when a woman is supposed to be beautiful, fragile, dependent. She is a controller of her own people, of the males in her own um, society. Uh, when the female should be dependent and subordinate. An indication clearly that black people can't make it. Freedom brought hope to black Americans. Millions of emancipated slaves were inspired by the promise of equality but this promise was betrayed. Those who, who wanted to re-establish firm white control, and wanted to maintain white supremacy by any means possible, used the argument that what had happened was that blacks no longer under the benign or beneficent or kindly guidance of whites were reverting to savagery. Political debate manipulated public fears about the so-called black menace. Old stereotypes were adopted to the new politics. Increasingly, blacks were identified as brutes. The states and people that favor this equality and amalgamation of the white and black races, God will exterminate. A man cannot commit so great an offense against his race, against his country, against his God, as to give his daughter in marriage to a nigra, a beast. This climate of racial hysteria was seen in every aspect of popular culture. The best example of, of this was in the writings of, of Thomas Dixon in his uh, novel The Klansman, which then later became a hit Broadway play and was finally adapted as the most successful of early American motion pictures, The Birth of a Nation. Described by President Woodrow Wilson as history writ in lightning, Birth of a Nation captured on film the classic caricature of blacks following Reconstruction. Here, emancipation was viewed as a tragic mistake. It had ended slavery and let loose blacks' wildest passions. Brute Negroes played by whites in blackface pursued white virgins. These images were guaranteed to incite racial violence, but more, they justified it. Earlier, we wouldn't have gotten an image of a brute Negro because this wouldn't have helped in the defense of slavery. Uh, to suggest earlier too much that there were people who were very, very rebellious uh, would have suggested that the blacks wanted to be free. The image that they needed was that the blacks were docile in antebellum times. During Reconstruction, the black is a challenge to the political system and they have to not only then try to justify uh, maybe a reason for going back to slavery, but they also are justifying their reasons for killing the blacks. Because they're saying that the blacks are on a, an offense to civilization.
these beings must be controlled, is what the mythology is telling us. And at the same time, in a very clever way, I think because it wants, the, 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 the planters also wanted to soothe people, wanted to make sure that they believed that their society could continue. They harken back to the good old days, the good old days when everybody is happy, the happy darky. Um, a way of saying, let's go back to those times. Remember those good old times when? Oh, there was an old darky and they call him Uncle Ned. But he died long ago, long ago. And he had no wool on the top of his head in the place where the wool ought to grow. Then lay down the shovel and the hoe and hang up the fiddle and the bow. No more hard work for poor Ned. He's gone where the good darkies go. No the older generation were the faithful retainers of the slave era. And the newer generation, however, was out of control. The blacks who had grown up in the, in the period since the Civil War and had never known the domesticating influence of slavery. So you have this two-pronged attack on blacks. On one hand, they reduced the servile, harmless, singing darkies of a, the good old times before the Civil War, where we really want to go back to. And you have an attack on supposedly what they've become now, vicious, a brutal, um, aggressive, violent. America at the turn of the century experienced unprecedented race hatred. Violence, Jim Crow segregation, mob terror became acceptable methods of social control. And always to justify such atrocity was the excuse of the animalistic black brute. caricatures of black children, or pickaninnies as they were once called, showed them as victims. Victims who evoked not sympathy, but the feeling that blacks were subhuman. They are always on the river, on the ground, in a tree, partially clad, dirty, their hair unkempt. This suggests that there was a need to imagine black children as animal-like, as savage. If you do that, if you make that step and say that these children are really like little furry animals, then it's much easier to justify the threat that's embodied in having an alligator pursuing the child. Seven little niggers playing tag with bricks. One was it most all the time, then there was but six. Six little niggas... One by one, black eyes. children disappeared, one targets of comic violence. Five. The symbolism in these images was revealing. Five little niggas playing, there was war. Material one objects tell hand. us there that four. there was still a segment of the population at large that was very uncomfortable with the black presence in the new world. And needed to get rid of them, artistically rendering a way of removing blacks so that there's nothing left. One little nigger in the scorching sun, soon there was the smell of smoke, and then there was none. As America crossed into the 20th century, these images were inherited by vaudeville and motion pictures. The forms were new, but the content was unchanged. In the minstrel tradition, black roles in films were still played by whites in blackface. When blacks finally began to play themselves, they faced a tragic dilemma. 
By the time blacks came to the minstrel stage, they had to perform in blackface. And so you had black men darkening their already dark skin with soot and widening their mouths and, and portraying themselves. Reuben Crowder was a black man from the Midwest who by the time he came to the minstrel stage had to take an Irish name because most minstrels were Irish men performing black characters. Um, what you have here is a weird warping of the American fabric. You know, when a black man takes an Irish name and then impersonates the impersonator, impersonating himself. So anybody who wanted to, who was black and who wanted to get on the theater, will do it like a, a pick and pat or molasses in January. Do what they do. Don't come telling me you can do Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poetry or James Weldon Johnson's poetry, or Georgia Douglas Johnson's poetry. No, nobody wants that. Give me a coon song. And one of these jokes. These black actors perceived the minstrel stage as a doorway, a doorway out of hunger, a doorway out of the South, a doorway to other opportunities. So we have an irony, or a catch-22 as the term goes, where we have the evolution of a people into a theatrical workforce at the same time that we have a perpetuation of a stereotype. <laughs> Against a broad spectrum of time-worn caricatures, the reality of black life in the early 1900s was undergoing dramatic change. In growing numbers, blacks were moving from the country to the city, from the south to the north. Emancipation had disrupted the social order of the south. Now black migration and competition for jobs threatened the status quo of the north. Racial hostilities began to brew. New caricatures of the urban coon emerged, reflecting the perceived threat of an expanding black labor force. for razor blades became trademarks of these urban caricatures. So bring along your blazers, stretch out your razors, Park Town is out tonight. It was a variation on the old theme. Blacks could be childishly entertaining and at once vicious brutes. The difference was in the instruments of amusement and violence. I don't suppose for a minute that any of you fools has got a razor. <laughs> By the way, Captain, can I join the Army, too? Certainly, reporters, James. Well, if I join the Army, can we use our railroads in this war? That's it, that's it, Captain. Can we use our railroads? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'll see about it. Get up. If they let us use our razors in this war, <laughs> we certainly call them Germans to the call. We ain't no advertisers, but there'll be no talk on prizes if they let us use our rivers in this war. I think World War I was a watershed for blacks. They, a lot of blacks went into that war with great hopes. They, they had been told for so long 
that if they played the game by the rules, that if they showed the white society what they were all about, if they made it up the hill by their own bootstraps, society would say, hey, welcome, join. But the service and self-esteem of black war veterans was undercut with caricature. Symbolically, these images reinforced white supremacy by fitting blacks within acceptable roles as servants and entertainers. The reality of black servicemen who now bore arms and demanded the freedom and opportunity at home they had fought for abroad. This reality inflamed many whites. Race riots swept the North each summer from 1919 to 1921. It was a period of overt and casual racism. It's perfectly polite for whites in the North, educated college types, uh, to write in uh, high-toned journals like Harper's in the Atlantic and Scribner's to use words like nigger and coon and darky. <laughs> Within these distorted molds of black behavior, black entertainers necessarily had to fit to win acceptance from mainstream audiences. Over time, black performers brought elements of humanity to the caricatures. Still, popular entertainment remained double-edged in its rewards, creating personal suffering and a cultural stigma as the price of success. Perhaps no more poignant example exists than in the life of Bert Williams. When life seems full of clouds and rain, and I am full of nothing and pain, who fools my sunken, sunken brain? Nobody. A tall, dignified man who spoke precise English, Bert Williams stooped his shoulders and learned to talk in the minstrel imitation of black speech. With the final touch of blackface, he became America's preeminent blackface artist. Oh, I know what you're thinking. I mean, I have heard all the rumors myself. It seems that this blackface makeup my white gloves and my comic gait ain't the only thing I'm becoming famous for. Or is it infamous? I have been trying to finish Bert's show for him. Yeah. And uh, my eulogy to Bert will be to finish the finale, you know, on his life by elevating him to the class of a folk artist and a folk hero that I think that he deserves. Well, now, you take last night, for example. I had just finished my show, and I was uh, about to step out for my evening constitution when I came upon a, what appeared to be a perfectly delightful watering hole. So I stepped up to the bar, and I asked the man for a bourbon. Well, the fella didn't take too kindly to serving a Negro. And so... To impress his friends, he said, that will be $50. Hell, I didn't bat an eye. I just stepped up to the bar, reached down in my pocket, whipped out a $500 bill and said, I'll take 10. <laughs> you know, it ain't really that funny. I mean, every critic in town agrees that I am at the height of my career. 
Zinkville pays me $6,500 a week here at the Follies, and that's top pay, but do I get top billing? Hell, I can play before the crown heads of York, but I can't even get a drink in my neighborhood pub. You know, they got this rule at the press club that says a black man can't even enter without a white host who is willing to sign that he'll be responsible for the black man's actions. Ain't I a responsible human being? There ain't a night that passes that somebody don't knock on that door and invite me over to the press club for a drink. Well, in case you didn't remember, buddy, this ain't exactly my regular skin tone, and it takes considerably longer to remove blackface than you can imagine. So unless somebody waits around, I wait around. That's right. I wait around outside the press club, just shifting my weight from one foot to the next until somebody comes by and escorts me in. All the time I'm just hoping and praying that nobody comes out and mistakes me for the doorman and tips me a quarter. You know, it's no disgrace being a black man. But it's terribly inconvenient. I never done the end of his life, Bird Williams managed to remove most of the offensively racist material from his routines. But long after his death, the blackface tradition continued, his dark mask now transferred to talking movies. I am privileged to say a few words to you in this most modern and novel manner. Privileged because it's the first living Vitaphone announcement ever made announcing the coming of one of the year's outstanding pictures. What is the picture? Oh, well, of course. You guessed that I'm referring to Warner Brothers, Supreme Triumph, Al Jolson in The Jazz Singer. When Al Jolson made his film debut in The Jazz Singer, Hollywood had emerged as the dominant force in popular entertainment. By 1927, more than 26 million Americans were going to the movies each week. What they saw reaffirmed the tradition of blackface entertainment that had prevailed since slavery. Why should hundreds of thousands perhaps millions over the years, of white people in all parts of the country have gone to theaters and watched white men pretend they were black. I think in part what they were watching was more complicated than merely whites masking themselves as blacks. They were watching whites release themselves as blacks. Mommy. Mommy. Suddenly these whites who were just like them could dance and sing and uh, show emotions openly and cry and laugh and uh, I, I think there was a kind of cathartic about this and I think blacks have played that role in this society. They have been a kind of surrogate. From the 20s through World War II, blackface permeated motion pictures. When this mask was abandoned, its imprint still warped film images of blacks, even when blacks played themselves. Please, take this dime now and hurry on back to town and get me that 
Beef liver. Uh, Hurry up now. All right. I can be running now. You want to put your shoes on? Well, I'm saving them in case my feet wear out. And then I have them. Long gone. Long gone. Of all media, cartoons provided the best form of racial caricature. I get misery in my feet. In this fantasy world, physical distortion and violence were comic. Before you die, you can make one last wish. Yeah? Well, uh, let's see now. Um, I wish, um... I wish him. I wish I wasn't the king. Hooray! Hooray! Oh, can I wait to sing this song? Do that, do that. Can I wait to come along? Fantastic, isn't it? Why the run all night? Why the run all day? I'll bet my money on a pop tonight. Somebody bet on the Together, songs, books like Little Black Sambo, and moving pictures captivated the young, but more. They shaped impressionable minds to view stereotypes as not only acceptable, but funny. And Big Black Jumbo, coming home from his work with a brass kettle under his arm for Black Mumbo, saw what was left of the tigers and said, What elegant melted butter! And when Black Mumbo saw the melted butter, she said, Now we'll all have pancakes for supper. I'm Little Black Sambo, and it's my birthday, and I'm going to eat 169 pancakes. It's going to be pancakes today. Businesses, too, profited from the public's affection for these images. Pancakes, beans, syrup, tobacco, oysters. Blacks appeared on these and more in product labels and household knickknacks. The cumulative effect of these images produced over and over again, seen over and over again. Images that are notions in the home, merely amusing notions, become really destructive stereotypes, notions of the mind. How did these images shape enduring attitudes toward black culture, behavior, appearance? Her cheek, her chin, her neck, her nose. This was a lily, that was a rose. Her bosom sleek as Paris pasta, her up to bowls of alabaster. This was the standard of beauty once heralded in America, a standard inherited from Europe. Against this image of perfection, Africans and African Americans were compared. Historically, these images reinforced the psychology that black is ugly. To be natural, or to be yourself, or be the way you were presented in this world is ugly. My lips don't look like large pieces of liver. My eyes aren't snow white are bulging in a frightening appearance. I wear my hair natural, but it isn't standing all over my head as though I'm wearing a fright wig. A total distortion of the black image. In these images, a subliminal message is clear. We can see how the portrayal of distinctive physical features of blacks become not only laughable, but grotesque.
Cartoons like this popularized the belief that black Americans had descended from savages. To use the 19th century cliche which prevailed almost up to our own time, Africa was the dark continent. It was the place where civilization had made the least progress indeed. It was the, it was the center of, of anti-civilization or primitivism of all, of all kinds. According to myth, slavery, then segregation, had managed to domesticate black Americans. But without white control, blacks reverted to savagery. In the 1920s and 30s, the savage stereotype acquired a new dimension. Look here, white man. I come and I go, and that's my business. <laughs> I'm afraid to stand right up to your betters and tell them what's what. There was a lot of talk about the new Negro during the 1920s, of the blacks being able to assert their manhood, their independence. But at the same time, there was a strain of the older ideas that, that uh, persisted. The, the idea of reversion to savagery, except that savagery was now redefined. Don't you all know that I've got a charm? A very good example of this would be the Emperor Jones. The sort of notion that if blacks were, were true to themselves, uh, they would be noble savages, perhaps, but still savages. So again, you're dealing with a stereotype, except you're taking the stereotype of the black savage and you're kind of giving it a more positive evaluation. Oh, Lord, no! Yes! The more comforting images of the Mammy, Sambo, and Uncle posed no threat. Happily, they entertained and served. Through this romantic fantasy, generations of Americans from the Civil War to this day escaped concern or responsibility for racism. It's the way down south in Dixie where dancing is a natural heritage of the Negro. From the beginning, popular entertainment was dominated by dancing, singing darkies. From the cakewalk to the jitterbug, an image was forged that blacks with inborn rhythm and musical talent were indifferent to poverty, subservience, segregation. As slaves, they danced even at their own auction block. Black's greatest joy, however, came in providing services to whites. Even their clothing revealed delight in their inferiority. They are only portrayed in full clothing that's neat and attractive to look at if they're wearing a uniform of some type. And a part of the uniform is a big smile. The smile says to the person looking at the object, this man's happy to carry my bags. This woman is happy to make my pancakes. These people are happy to spend their lives serving the white population. They're happy to be confined in this way and never devote any energy to thinking about themselves as oppressed. The civil rights movement brought deep contradictions in America to a head. Restrictive molds cast before the Civil War finally began to crumble 100 years later.
In the end, Ethel Waters' melancholy song yielded to a more triumphant call. And so this afternoon I have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream. Hockey's never dream. The sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to live together as brothers. I have a dream this afternoon. judged on the basis of the content of their character, not the color of their skin. I have a dream. I have a dream this evening that one day we will recognize the words of Jefferson that all are created equal, that they are endowed by their... By the mid-60s, world attention was focused on the brutal reality of American racism. In this climate of national embarrassment and gradual reform, happy images of the past rang hollow. Slowly, popular culture adapted to the new tide in politics and attitudes. By the late 60s, the more extreme caricatures had begun a slow death. But did this mean an end to the more subtle forms of racial stereotyping? The images of the past, I think, are still, are still with us. Uh, they may be altered in some ways and used in different ways. Uh, one example of this would be the figure that might be called a, the Black Rambo. Uh, this is the black cop or the uh, black detective, or the black sidekick of the white detective, whatever it might be, who is engaged in fighting the forces of evil. Uh, the reason I say that this goes back to the old stereotype is that there's an emphasis on violence and brutality. It's as if these characters, as opposed at least to some of the white characters, are given a license to be even more violent uh, than the, the, white, the white heroes. Uh, that there's, that the filmmaker or the maker of the TV program is sort of capitalizing on the stereotype of blacks as being violent and brutal even though now they're on the right side. When I look at the material from the 1970s and 1980s, I basically see the same thing I saw I see in the earlier materials. I see greeting cards with big heavy mammies on them. I see TV programs with a, a mammy figure in the household. I see uh, black comedians playing the role of the minstrel or the buffoon in movies and so forth. I have students, both black and white, who believe these images huh? because it has become a thread throughout the major fiction, film, popular culture, the songs, even the jokes black people make about themselves. It has become a part of our psyche. It's a real indication that one of the best ways of maintaining a system of oppression has to do with the psychological control of people. Mammy, Sambo, Piccaninny, Coon, Uncle. The great grandparents of many modern images of blacks these caricatures did as much harm as any lynch mob. True, their hurt was often indirect. Yet because of this, they left wounds that have proved far more difficult to heal. These are their descendants. As we turn to contemporary culture, how will we judge? What do these images reveal? about our innermost fears, our hopes, our most enduring fantasies. There is nothing wrong with tap dancing. There is nothing wrong with using your voice and your body as a musical instrument. 
It is the laughter and the music and the dancing at the exclusion of dramatic images, of realistic images, which is at fault. And it's this exclusion which we hope to dissolve.